but sleeping pugs if you're like what the hell is this game i've never seen it before <laughs> it's basically a cooperative 2d exploration game and what we're going to talk about in this in this talk is basically bsp's debut and a little bit of the game design about butt sniffing pugs uh, and how our design decisions help our game see us game design differently and uh, because it's kind of an orthodox game you have a giant butt trackball controller <laughs> as you might see up there and uh, it's it doesn't have any objectives it's kind of a sandbox game you can, there are objectives that you are can do for rewards but we wanted to make a game that was not a game and more of like an interactive play thing and a game that's kind of just about fun. So something I want to clarify before this talk so that you can process what we're saying in different ways. That this isn't a like game design success tips talk. And, like look at what we did for like butts and pugs and like apply <laughs> that to you. It's not that. Because in my opinion, success is kind of like this accumulation of random chance, uh, luck, uh, sometimes privilege, and it would be silly for anybody to try to be, see butt sniffing pugs and be like, oh, I'm going to try to replicate the success of bugs, butts and pugs in my own way. That would be silly. And <laughs> it would be silly for me to do that with another game. And so as we talk, I want you to think and be like, how can I apply what they're saying to my art, to my game? And the reason why I say all this is because trying to replicate someone's success was the first thing I did wrong with BSP. I should have figured it out. I should have listened to her because BSP was her revision of my original idea. And that was this. Uh, right here. Create positive experiences that give people joy, aka don't imitate Undertale, imitate somebody <laughs> like Toby Fox. <laughs> so Toby Fox made a game called Undertale, which is his own take on RPGs and the game called Earthbound. And this translates to don't make games because you want them to be massive hits or because you expect them to copy the success of the original game. Uh, this sounds something like really obvious, but it was what I did with a game called Tenyawanya Teens, which is to the right. Tenyawanya Teens is a game that has a bazillion buttons and it's kind of like a memory game that you play with two players and you're pressing buttons near certain actions in the game. And so I saw this my first GDC and it's like, oh my God, this is so great. Like, I love this, I, let's just make this with pugs. And that was the worst idea I could have done because the first version of BSP was this game where there was like five million pugs on screen, different inputs, it was competitive multiplayer, so it was like super fast and everybody like saw it and gave you that look if friends, you show people your games, they're like, yeah, this is great. <laughs> and I know my, this is the worst thing ever. <laughs> and then eventually Michelle came to me and she was like, I love you, but this is garbage. But there are two good things about this game. And we need to take those aspects and make those into a game. And I think that will do good. And those were easily exploring an interactive world and doing so with a friend. Those are the two aspects of the original competitive multiplayer that she thought, because she's not a gamer game designer. I'm a gamer game designer. And so I was building this game in this tunnel vision and having a different mindset open my eyes up. And I realized, OK, that's something that might be viable you know, to make a game just making a simple game about just fun with unnecessary objectives. You know, the, I love Pikmin 3, but I hate like sunset coming down and seeing all friends that might die. I just want to like sit and like watch the sunset and be in this nice world. So it's like, let's try to make a game like that where people can just be peaceful in a nice virtual space. And so we decided to do that through <laughs> not something everybody might do, make a <laughs> custom controller for accessibility and design game mechanics around joy not happiness joy um and once we started focusing on design i think that things started to come into place we weren't focused on success we weren't focused on making money we were focused on making a good game with good design and the puzzle pieces started to click in and you know upon realizing that success is not an attainable item success is something that happens kind of as a circumstance when you showcase the most beautiful aspects of your game you know and you know i think that on all of our games, we see something beautiful. We want to make that, you know, whether it's like this design or whether it's an art direction. I think that we see success when people like that showcase through our design and the end product. And one of the other reasons, so I'm going to talk about joy first. One of the reasons we decided to design around joy um, is we decided to go for this aspect of like yellow game design. Uh, there's this quote from Tim O'Reilly that says, money for your project is like having gas for your car. You need to pay attention to it, otherwise you'll end up on the side of the road. 
but a well-lived life is not just a tour of gas stations. So the idea that like you can make games, you can make games for money and money and money, but is that like a fulfilled life? You know, it's like, why don't you want to make the games that you're dreaming about or the games that make you feel good? And so that's what we decided to do. And there was like this kind of like, YOLO, like, let's just make a game about butts and pugs, because why not? Because that is more fulfilling for us, and it lets money and success be a servant to our game. Rather than, I think you see a lot of games, money and success is kind of like a slave, or their game's a slave to that. And so they're designing around this, and that's kind of what I did wrong the first time, and we kind of flip-flop that. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little, explain a little bit about joy and how sometimes people design games around like feel and stuff like that, and that's kind of what I did with the first prototype, and how we decide to design around an emotion. So if happiness is singular and joy is plural, the idea that happiness is kind of a state of being, it's like a, a fleeting sensation based on oneself. Um, you know, like if I had a really good pancake today, that was an experience that I experienced, and that was like a happiness that I had, um, that Michelle did not have, and that was fleeting because I don't like it was a pancake, like <laughs> whatever. It's not something I'm gonna remember, and I like, tell my kids, I'm like, oh my gosh, do you remember? I want to tell you, I had this pancake in New York, and it was amazing. <laughs> that might happen sometimes if you have like really good food, <laughs> and that might be an experience with like joy that you share with your body. But I, you know, happiness is singular, so let's focus on that. Joy is an experience that's plural, that's often with other people, or that's an experience outside of yourself. Uh, it's a greater emotion than happiness because it moves a person out of a self-centered orientation towards others, which is more memorable for like your long-term memory and stuff like that. So like when me and Michelle go to Central Park together yesterday and we share this experience that we're making a game about Central Park and we've never been there. <laughs> and then we go there and we're like, oh my God, this is amazing. And like we share this joy experience that I will remember. That's like an example of an experience of joy. And so we thought, okay, Let's design a video game around this, a video game that is around multiplayer connections that you share with another person that makes our game more memorable and not just about like one person. And that's also fulfilling as us because basically people are coming to play butt sniffing pugs and they could be coming as strangers but leaving as friends, you know, because it's all about being with that other person in this space. And that's really cool, you know, to see like happiness just come out from exploring as a pug. So that's why we decided to design around joy. And because of this kind of negative bias thing, which I want to talk about, that kind of, we as humans can be really negative sometimes and focus on that a lot. Uh, there's a quote from neuroscientist Dr. Rick Hansen, and that says, our brain is like Velcro to negative experiences and Teflon to positive ones. Since our, it goes like fearful, hateful, like negative thoughts. The science behind this is that those kind of negative thoughts have more neural activity. So like when you have like a bad thought, your neurons just like stick onto it. And because the neurons stick, they're easily able to process it in your long-term memory, which is why it's really easy. Like when you have a good day and it's like you step in dog poop, you're just like, <laughs> I'm over it. <laughs> and like that stays in your long-term memory. It can ruin your day. And with positive, loving, grateful thoughts, uh, the reason why it's so hard is because they have less neural activity. You know, it's, it's like a, a quick like dopamine hit. Or like just, oh, like that's nice. And the science behind it is that in order to save a positive thought into your long-term memory, it takes like about like 12 seconds. So think about that. 12 seconds. That's kind of like a long time. The idea that like if I'm looking at your game or if I'm like looking at a piece of art, I could be like, oh, that's nice. And then just like walk by but for me to like stand at your game or a piece of art and just like, I think I'm at four. <laughs> and I like, sit there for ten, like 12 seconds. That's a long ass time, you know, to like somebody to process it and savor and consciously save your game or your piece of art into their long-term memory. And so a lot of, I want to talk about all control now. You know, we talked about joy. I think there's something about the awe of inventions that makes games and art hit that 12 second rule. You know, from left to right, we have Tenuwani teams, we have the Choose a Tron, we have Lime Wobbler, we have Panorama Goal. There's something about creating something physical in like the real world outside of the screen that makes people just in awe and makes people remember these inventions and stuff like that. Uh, and so 
it's part of the pug buttness and the awkwardness. Some of it was intentional because we're like, there's this negative bias. People don't pay attention to games because there's a million games in the world. So what can we do to increase our awe? What can we do to make people wonder about butt sucking pugs? So we did like all of these different things. You have the pug butt awkwardness. So people see this butt on this thing and they're like, God, that might make people just wait there for like 30 minutes because they don't know what the hell our game is. <laughs> um, we have the trackball accessibility. So the giant tennis ball is essentially a giant trackball. So immediately people can use it. And so even if they do play it, there's probably a chance that they're still getting the hang of the controls. So they're probably there for a long time. And then there's the invention. You know, Bust of Ink Pugs, we made it for all control GC. So there's a likelihood of like all of these things add up that add all. People are probably going to remember Bust of Ink Pugs, whether it's positive or negative. Uh, they'll remember it. And that's kind of like what our design was like based around. So that no matter what they do, they remember it. And hopefully they remember it positive and they have a good experience because we designed it around joy. But if they don't, at least they'll remember it. And maybe they'll tell it to their friend to be like, I saw this stupid game with plus and pugs. <laughs> that's, that's, you know, a plus in my book. Um, so I want to ask really quick, after we go to the next segment, how are you making people savor your art, your games? Try to think, how can people not just stand at my game, but savor it for 12 seconds. And you know what, maybe your game, like maybe the stuff that we're, I'm saying doesn't relate to you. Maybe your game's like about challenge. Maybe your game's like not even a game. It's like something totally in like left field. Uh, because Butts of Pugs is about simple fun. Um, but for us, we want to create positive interactive experiences and show on wonder. So that's kind of like what we're trying to do with BSP. Okay, so our second point was fun first, accessibility second, message last. There's gonna be, uh, there's like these tiles on top and everything on the bottom. These are the messages that we like focused on for all these points. So I wanna tell a quick story about how we met PewDiePie. <laughs> and this is another example of like, luck just randomly hits you sometimes and there's no way that could have like <laughs> happened again. Uh, so basically how we decided to go all in and design games for accessibility after this PewDiePie thing happened. Um, so, PewDiePie randomly slid into my DMs, I think, like, <laughs> uh, sometime last year. And he was like, hey, I like Pugs. Your game sounds rad. I want to meet you at PAX. And I was like, oh, OK. Yeah, sure. Like, do I have to like talk to your agent? Do I have to do random things? He's like, no, he just hit me on my email. I probably shouldn't be doing this, because I don't know what I'm doing, but whatever. <laughs> I was like, oh, OK. <laughs> and then we get there at PAX. This was our setup for PAX last year. And we almost had like this like Disney line queue because our game is like five minutes long. And we just push people through for two people. So we had this like semi force field. And then I didn't even see it because I was giving a demo, but you saw him come. Yeah. And like, what happened? It was like Moses parting the Red Sea. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty intense. There was like security guards and like all this stuff. And she's just like, he's here. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> And I turn around and we, we play the game with him and you know he loved it uh there's gonna be like some pewdiepie content in it and he's a really genuine person despite what people say um and i say that because this kind of thing to happen is an extreme highlight but i only show this to also showcase how the next thing was also an amazing highlight up to this level if not higher in my opinion at the end of pax there's like enforcers and stuff like that and when PAX closes at like five or six, these people are like on the ball and they're like, get out. And like everybody, <laughs> if you're still on the floor and you're not like showcasing, they push your ass out of there. They get everybody out. And so I see this dad and this kid walking by. And I immediately have like a thought. I go off and like, shit, they're going to push this kid out. And my first thought too is this guy's in a wheelchair. Like there probably wasn't a lot of games to play at PAX because there are a lot of man childs, a lot of sweaty boys like pushing and getting to those lines. <laughs> so I'm like, this kid hasn't probably played a lot of games. They're going to push him out. And I scream like a lunatic. I'm like, come play the butt pug game. And I wave to this kid who's probably back there. And I see his dad and I'm like, just, just get over here. And then once he got in the zone, he would be safe. And so they got in the zone in like slow motion because pugs is, uh, the controller is kind of, like wiry, it's like, you know, DIY mouse. I like see him coming and I like, <laughs> this thing, you know, so you can like fit it in the wheelchair. And normally, where is a point where I can get very um, iterative and say the same thing over and over again to tutorials and be like, okay, now you have to do this. Now you have to do this. I just told him, I'm just like, just have fun. And just, you know, just have fun in this place. 
And there was a moment <laughs> when his dad looked at me and he just, he just said, thank you. And I was like, oh, <laughs> look at him now. And there was a moment where I looked at Michelle and I was like, I love you. And I was like trying to hold it in, but I couldn't. <laughs> and like that moment with that kid, you know, though he was only to, to be able to play one game. That is like, I looked to myself and I was like, this is why I'm making games. It's so that people like him, you know, people that don't play games, you know, are able, because we're here because we love games. And whether we're talking about that through design, through our own games, we want other people to experience that joy. And I was like, this is why I'm doing it. And, you know, PewDiePie was great, but I would hope that I would catalyze that feeling and that accessibility and be able to do that to all my games. Because accessibility is not, I think sometimes people think about it as a negative option. You know, people are like, well, I have to do all this work and blah, blah, blah. And I want people to realize that sometimes accessibility is kind of like a vegetarian option. It does your <laughs> core design, you know? If you have a chef and he serves meat and you like go to the restaurant, and he's like, oh, I'm vegetarian, you still got any vegetarian friends? He's like, no, <laughs> like, we are meat only. <laughs> brother like you can serve like little veggies on the side <laughs> i understand if, okay, if your thing is like totally pork and you're mean only restaurant sure but vegetarian options don't hurt the core design if there's like a meat serving chef and he serves a vegetarian option he's gonna get all those beautiful vegans and all those beautiful healthy vegetarian people <laughs> into his restaurant and i like to compare that to accessibility because that's a lot of what accessibility is like you know for us part of the core design of bsp is around that accessibility but it doesn't have to be that for anybody you know, to make your game colorblind friendly, it just takes figuring out what the right colors are. You know, to make your game controllable and to have good, simple UI that's not confusing to read or that has, like, good subtitles for deaf people, that's just, like, wording things differently and stuff like that. Up on the screen, there's a little PDF called Includification. Uh, one of our partners is Able Gamers, and they are a company that hacks video game controllers so that kids with disabilities can play. And they have this amazing PDF. If you go to includification.com, it's at the end. It's basically this giant PDF and it's like, okay, here's like a bazillion ass things you can do to make your games accessible. But it's great because it's tiered. And so like tier one is like minimum. So it's like, okay, like make sure your controls are like remappable. That's like one of the main things for people with disabilities. And then it like goes into depth. So like maybe part two is like, okay, make sure they're like remappable. Uh, make sure that you have options for like all controllers possible, you know, and it goes into like color blindness. And like, if you want to go tier three, uh, good, good luck. <laughs> it's like a bazillion things for all these people with disabilities, but they do a great job at that. And that's why we're partnering with them so that like we're going to make BSP and send it to them. Be like, okay, what are we to run? Again, <laughs> like, help us and help us make this game accessible so that people of all audiences can play. So I would encourage you, you know, if you're considering it at the least, maybe just look at it and be, see if there's something simple that you could do. Like, oh, that's not that hard. I can just slot that in. Because those people with disabilities, they're gameless. You can imagine how if you like change one thing, how they're like, they're like, oh my god, <laughs> colorblind. That's like they just flock to your game. Okay. <laughs> so use games to speak about something greater. Why is your game special? I think we're in a market where, like, somebody could talk to me and say, like, I'm making a game, and like person's pressure, but who cares? Like, ah, there's like a million games. <laughs> it's really hard to get like into this marketplace because there's like five bazillion different games. And so that's why personally we're like, okay, let's use game design as a catalyst to speak about something greater than the game. Because not only does that be like, ha ah, like YOLO, like fuck you, whatever. Like we're just gonna do our thing because we love our games. You could get success from having your own story or having a message in your game. And if you have success, great. If you don't, whatever. Like you're having your great old time making the stuff that you want to make. Um, and for us, this was beneficial because BSP kind of became like a story. And so press was coming to us because BSP is more than a game. It's about accessibility. It's about moms having fun with games, which doesn't happen often. <laughs> it's about like all these different things. And so they were like, What's, what, what, is, what is going on? What's the secret, the, the secret sauce behind your butt pugs? And we would talk to them about it. And then they also, you know, being pressed, they had something to write about. You know, they're not just saying like, this is a first person shooter that has roguelike elements. No, they had like a whole story <laughs> and they had like five different things that they could cherry pick from. And that's, you know, very helpful for press if you have like those story <coughs> options and et cetera. And it's fulfilling as hell. 
And so these are game design philosophies, and I recognize that they're not for everyone, but you know, maybe you just want to make a video game and accessibility isn't viable for you because you're like, I'm getting on Steam, Gabe. There's no way I can add anything right now. And that's fine, but I would hope that you would at least choose this for future games or maybe in future design that you would see accessibility and maybe think of that the next time you're designing. Or when you're doing design, think about the 12-second rule and how maybe making awe or like joy and beautifulness, like that's part of your design. You're like, people are staying on my game now because you know, they wonder about it, and that remembers, and so people come back to me. Um, because for us, we chose to not make that like a vegetarian option, but to go the whole way, which is why I wanna like, take a little quick pitch and like say that we're gonna be on Kickstarter, because we tried going to other places, and you'd be surprised, even though Butts of Fame Pugs is like kind of popular, people are like, ha ha ha, you're silly. But Pugs is not viable. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, oh, but you... <laughs> Uh, just wait, <laughs> just wait one second. And so we're gonna go to Kickstarter because that allows us to have the full freedom. Because if we're gonna go, we're gonna go all in. You know, we wanna push that envelope. We wanna mod the trackball controller so that it can be used for Steam and it can be remappable. So that like maybe one day we'll mass produce them and you can buy this giant trackball with or without a butt. You know, we wanna do Kickstarter so that we can partner with able gamers and push them with, uh, with us and make accessibility more well known. Uh, and we wanted to just give players a little puggy virtual world that anybody can explore for fun. <laughs> um, because I think we as developers have so much talent and we can do so much more than provide escapism. That's great. I love just, you know, coming home from work and being like, hold on Michelle, and just like, Stardew Valley. And just like <laughs> escaping. And I love that, but we have, we can do so much. You know, we can change one, ten, all these people's lives through game design because I believe it is one of the most best and mediums that is still being developed. And we recognize that through like VR, through alt controls. And I would hope that we would try to push stuff outside the screen. We would try to say things through our games and push this medium to its limit. And that is our talk.